Good morning. Good to see all of you in the midst of the uh, cold and the ice and the snow and the COVID and all the stuff that's kind of gone on. We've kind of been hit hard over the last month or two, so it's good to see your faces today. I want to read the scripture to you out of Isaiah chapter 40 as we continue to celebrate who God is today. It says, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's a great word, isn't it? To wait upon the Lord. And today, in the midst of worship, there is a sense of waiting upon God. As we gather here, we expect Him to do something among us. But as we worship, there is a sense of waiting upon God. So I'm not sure what God may want to do in this place today, but I know He wants to do something. The question is, are we going to open our hearts and lives up? Are we going to be willing to have God speak into us and actually do what he wants us to do? That's what we do in this place. That's what worship is. You see, it, it may be a routine for some. For me, it's an experience every time I gather. We are gathered here together, and it's an experience. And I want to experience the Holy Spirit of God today, don't you? So would you stand with us this morning as we worship? Get your voice warmed up and sing it out. Farmdale family. 
Just wanted to let you know that your contribution statements for 2021 are ready and they can be picked up at the Welcome Center. Uh, if you have any questions or any concerns, then please get a hold of Bill Meadows, Treasurer of the Church. Uh, if you would like to have your contribution statement sent to you electronically, then please text me your email address and I'll get that right out to you. Thanks again for all that you've done for Farmdale and helping build and supporting the ministries of the church. Farmdale men, just a reminder that on Wednesdays at 2.30 in the afternoons here at the church, there is a Bible study uh, for those who work second shift or third shift and just can't be here on Wednesday nights. Uh, we have that going right now at 2.30. If you just have a struggle driving, there's some of our older guys who just struggle to drive at night, and they're also been coming and participating uh, on Wednesday afternoons. So we'd love to see you Wednesday at 2.30. And for those of you who can be here on Wednesday night, that study is at 7 p.m. And so uh, for some of you, it's time to get back in the swing of it. Hope to see you then. Farmdale teens, exciting news for you at 9.30 on Sunday mornings. Uh, we have a small group for your age group. Uh, Brent Hartshorn is leading that. So just wanted you all to know on 930 on Sunday mornings, there's something for you to come and participate in. Hey, Farmdale family, I'm excited to announce that on February 13th, right after the morning service, we'll be having a youth fundraiser lunch and you can buy tickets uh, from any of the teens or from Crystal Portman or Jenny Dempsey or Lisa Hensley. Uh, it's $20 for a family and $10 per, for individuals. It's going to be a good time to uh, just to help support the youth of the church and some of the events they have coming up. So we hope all of you will get a ticket for that day. On February 13th at 6 p.m. is the big game party here at the church. I'm glad to have that uh, party going again this year. So at 6 p.m. the doors will open. You have, if you're a teenager or a kid, you have to have an adult chaperone with you here uh, to be at the party. Uh, we ask you bring enough food for you and just to share a little bit with somebody else um, for that night as we celebrate and watch the big game. Just wanted to give you a quick reminder that we're going to take up the alabaster offering on February 13th during the morning worship. The reason I want to remind you is not because we have a goal of amount that we want to give. That's not the, the purpose of me teaching you about alabaster. My goal is to teach. I want you to understand how wonderful the Church of the Nazarene is how we reach out and we are a global church and we reach out and network with one another and help one another. That's my real goal. But it's been fun. It's been fun working with Hudson, teaching him. He doesn't understand that it goes for land and buildings and churches and hospitals, but he understands it's for Jesus. And he's had fun collecting money. So I want you to have that same excitement and on uh, February 13th, we'll have a little march, we'll have baskets, we'll put our offering in. I don't use a box, I give a check to make it easier for the counters. So in whatever way you'd like to give, if you want to give, it'll be that morning in the worship service. And I just want you to be excited about what the Church of Nazarene does and their love for peoples around the world. We sure do appreciate in missions everything you do to help. I'm considering having Hudson start raising money at the church. Um, he's been great at doing that. I'm not very good at that, but he's been very good at that. So glad to hear it. I've got a couple of extra things I just want to talk about. Next week is the big game. And for all of you who were rooting against my 49ers, 
You got your way. You got your way. Yes, it was awful. Um, so anyway, uh, I get to come and support the Cincinnati Bengals next week. And uh, hope they do that. Yeah, yeah. Hope that works out um, for all of you who are Bengals fans. But uh, it's been a rough week for me because I was really looking forward to supporting my Niners in the Super Bowl. Next week, though, there's a couple things I need for you to know. It's going to be a different service next week. Uh, it is the big game day. I want you, you may not know this, but Super Bowl Sunday is the second largest gathering of people in a year's time in our nation. Okay, So the first largest gathering is Christmas. The second is Super Bowl Sunday, literally the largest gathering of groups of people in our country. So it is a big d d day. It's a, basically a holiday in some ways for some. And some of you go, I don't care anything about sports. That's fine, but it's still a big day. And there's a lot that goes on with that. So next Sunday's service is going to be different here. Um, th there's a thing called Football Sunday, and they celebrate that day. They do testimony from some of the, some of the athletes. Um, Tony Dungy's a big part of that. And so next week, as part of the, the ceremonies uh, of the church and the service that next week, we're going to actually hear from some of this. And it's going to be a good week to gather and do that. Also, you can wear any jersey you want to. No one will look down upon you if you wear green and gold for the Packers. No one will do that. Or the Dallas Cowboys. No one will be upset if you wear those. I will be in my 49er gear next Sunday. You can wear what you want. Now, you say, I don't have any of that. or NFL. Then wear your college stuff, whatever. It's just going to be one of those fun days for us next Sunday. And that will happen. So do that. Bring it on in here, and we'll have a good time with it. And after the service, so this is just a day full of celebration and party. It's going to be a great day, yes. After the service, you get a chance to go eat a good meal right after. Now, someone told me this last week, and it was really good, because I've been doing the youth group now for several months. Um, we are hopefully in the process of figuring out who's going to be the youth pastor here, but as I've been working with the teens and doing that kind of stuff, you have to raise funds for all the stuff they've got going. They're actually leaving to go to Nashville at the end of March for TNT at TNU. I think we have five or six students going to represent Farmdale and Kentucky in Nashville for, for the events, which is a good thing. Uh, but they need funds to do that and help do that. So when you come back here, and they're going to serve you next Sunday. They're going to serve the food. So right after service, you go back. They'll serve the food to you. You can, you can get a ticket out here today. Someone told me last week, they said, you said it was $20 a family and $10 per individual. I said, yeah, that's what it says. And some, somebody said, but didn't, don't you say we're all family at Farmville? I go, yes, that's awesome. Everybody give $20. <laughs> so you're right, we're all family. I've, whoever said that was thinking really, really uh, in intelligent ways. So you give what you want to do that. If you're a guest here, listen, if you're a guest or new, you've only been coming here for a month or two, you just come and eat with us for free, all right? You just come and eat, be a part of the day and celebrate. But if not, we just need those things to come in for the kids. And then in March, we, you all know I love March uh, and usually do bracket stuff and whatever. But in March, as we get looking toward March, uh, we're going to do a calendar thing as well where you can just sign up. A kid will have a calendar, and you might sign up on day three, and that means you only give $3. Uh, if you want to sign up like 25, that's what you do, and all of that will help us do some of the stuff we're trying to do. Um, we need to get a hold of some of this stuff. So I really appreciate your support in that. The, the teens really appreciate your support. Yes? Yep, we'll take anything. So <laughs> except for the stuff you're taking to Goodwill, we'll take anything here and do whatever you can to help them do that. Um, so we've always supported these kids, and we want them to work for it too. Understand they're not doing anything to get that. They're going to serve next week, okay? So uh, those that serve will be getting a portion of that to go. And if you say, hey, I don't like the menu, and I don't want to eat there in that room and be in a crowd right now, that's fine. That's fine. You can still give. Or you can say, can I get a box to go home, and we'll, we'll box it up for you and let you take it home, okay? There's ways to do this. So that's next week. And don't forget to wear your uh, jerseys or hoodies or whatever it is next week, all right? It's going to be a good day. Let's stand and continue in worship. No. 
song these altars are open if you'd like to come and pray this morning
So Friday night, we uh, had a chance to let Grant celebrate his birthday from a, a few weeks back, bring some friends over to the house. And uh, usually that means it's a little rowdy in the home and nerf wars or whatever it may be, and we're fine with all that. Uh, as long as they pick it up, I am. And uh, so it was about midnight on Friday night, and it's time for bed, and I go and tell these kids, you got to go to sleep. And I went to sleep and didn't hear anything. And about 3 a.m., well, I didn't know it was 3 a.m., but I heard all this commotion, craziness going on. And I thought, man, is it already time to get up? These kids are already going wild. And so I, I turn over and hit the phone. It's 3 a.m. And so I go down and I tell them to stop. I said, I think I already told you not to be, you know, to go to sleep. So it's 3 a.m. I was thinking about that little silly scenario. At kids, you know, sometimes they hear what they want. They listen when they want. They do those kind of things. And as I was doing that, and the second time, they finally calmed it down. But I was thinking about this. I went back to bed. I started to pray. I was awake, and I started to pray for situations. And I realized that it, even though they didn't listen the first time, I realized in that moment as I prayed, doesn't matter what the time was, the hour was, what was on my heart or mind, God was listening and hearing. That's wild to me. And so I'm sitting there doing it. I want you to know today that it really doesn't matter. There's a story in the Old Testament where Abraham and Sarah have dealt harshly with a woman that was part of their, uh, their camp. Her name's Hagar. And she runs away because she's been dealt harshly with. She's been really mistreated, abandoned in some forms, or pushed away in some ways. And she heads out into the desert, and she runs, and she's crying. And the story tells us she's actually an Egyptian. She didn't believe in the God of Israel she didn't believe in him or anything, but she starts to cry out. And as she cries out, the story tells us that God hears her cries, that he sees her. And she names him there as the God who sees me. But ultimately, if you get down to language, the God who hears me. She didn't even know who this God was. But in those moments, she recognized he heard her cry, even though she wasn't even following him. And so this morning, I don't know your story, but I'm telling you now, if you cry out, this God will hear you. And he will listen to you. And that may blow your mind. It does mine every time. But that's the truth of this today. And so when you see the list, there's a lot of stuff I want to cry out about. He's going to hear that. He's going to listen. He promises to. And he deals with it. And so this morning, we've been hit. I told you, this last two months for our church family has been absolutely difficult. Not just from sickness, from death, and situations because of it. There's a lot of brokenness here. I want you just to know you cry out. Just cry out. See what God may do in the midst of your cry. Jesus, we thank you for who you are. And God, we, I, it does blow my mind that you somehow love the praises and you love to hear from us. Whatever our week has been like, whatever we've been up against, maybe we've neglected our times with you, maybe we've pushed you to the side, maybe we've tried to put things before you, and yet somehow you still enjoy hearing from us. And so God, this morning as we gather here, we want to hear from you. We want you to speak to our hearts, we want to help you you to help us remove distraction and deal with who we are. Not try to wear a mask and be phony in this place, but to be real. Because you already know us. And we want to cry out where we need to cry out. And God, I'll be the first to tell you, I'm, I'm frustrated. <coughs> I'm tired. I'm exhausted of the continual battle of who's sick, who's not. I can't even keep up with how many people. Can we help these folks? Can we get stuff? Because there's so much at once. And then there's the other stories that break our hearts of the tragedy in our church of death and sorrow and grief. And so, I pray you just hear the cry of my heart and know that I need your strength today. As the scripture said earlier, Lord, I, I am waiting for you. And so there's people right here right now, for some, they, they, they're waiting on you for something today. They need Maybe the word's a miracle. They need a touch. They need some added strength. They need uh, some help with their belief. So whatever that is, I know you're good to do it. Because nothing is impossible for you. You are the unstoppable God. And your glory moves on and on. And so I pray your glory move on through us today. 
I pray for healing to come to those who are battling with this pandemic. We'd love, Lord, for you to erase this pandemic from the earth. And you are able. We may not understand why you haven't, but you are able. And for those who need a touch, we pray you do so. For those who are battling with cancer and going through treatments, we pray that, God, that this healing could come. And not just for the sense of some physical healing, but that you would gain glory for it, that we would celebrate in this assembly in the world of what you've been able to do. Because some of those stories will only be glory stories because the doctors have given up. And so we trust you with them today. And God, we pray that you just help us be more like you in everything we do and say and act. We want to be like you. So move in this place. Be with those who are grieving. And we give you praise today for meeting with us and listening to us and speaking to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. You can turn to Acts chapter 2 if you'd like. Take any posture you choose. Some of you just sat down. You can stay that way if you'd like. So we read God's Word. That's what the Word says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Isn't that good news? You can be seated. Well, we continue with our series a journey in grace. We entered this expedition by discussing the compelling grace of God some weeks ago. We discovered that there's something about Jesus that invites us to come and see, but that will eventually lead to follow me. From there, we drove on down the road a bit to see that God pursues us long before we know it or understand it. It is called the provenient grace of God. Then we sped up and discussed the more popular term of grace known as saving grace. God wants to bring us salvation not just for a ticket to heaven, we learned, but for this life here and now. And then last week we slowed down to take a long look at sanctifying grace, the deeper work of God in us that transforms us from who we were to who God desires that we be. And this week we move on to see that God wants to conti- us to continue on the path with Him in ways that help us nurture and nourish our relationship with Him. This is about living out the faith in a consistent manner. The ability to do so is through what we call sustaining grace. Sustaining grace. Some years ago, I, I decided to do something I had never done before. I decided I was going to enter into a 5K in downtown Louisville. Now, for some of you, that's, that's no big deal. 3.2 miles are a walk in the park for a lot of folks. But I'm pretty sure those are the people that God has blessed with bigger lungs. I just had to be. I was never a long-distance runner. Uh, you know, the sports I was involved in required sprints or short-distance bursts. I think the most I ever really was asked to do at one time was about two miles or a little over. And that was just a couple of times during conditioning. So training for 3.2 miles was a big deal for me, and I decided I was going to run this 5K and do, do it without ever stopping for a second to walk, and I admit to you that I did many things along this process to get ready for this race. I talked with others that had run these things many times before. I bought the shoes that were suggested. I ran daily on the treadmill at home. I, I kept up with the pace. The week of the race, I double-checked with the experienced runners what should be my routine the days before the race. You know, I was all into this. It's only 3.2 miles, but I was all in. I took it very seriously. I, I kept to my plans as well. And I didn't let any feelings, I didn't you know how I was feeling or whatever, my body or any interruption stop me from doing what I had charted to do for that day. I just did it. And each day I achieved the goal. 
And I felt so good. A lot of good emotions. I, I thought I might surprise a lot of people, maybe win my age division. At least that's what I thought down there while I was running. The day of the race came, and uh, I, it was a cold morning, but the sun was shining down, and we lined up, and we took off. I think it was a gun, or I don't know how they started. And we took off, and I ran beside one of the people I le leaned on through this training time. Some of y'all remember John Lockwood, who was part of our congregation before they moved to Texas. And, and as we went along running beside him, he'd say, he'd say, easy, easy. I don't know how to do easy much. He'd say, easy. And he'd say, take a deep breath, deep breath. Pick up the pace a bit. Pick up the pace a bit. H having John as a guide made things better for me. He was like 20-some years older than me, but he was a much better runner than me. And the cold air made the running a little more strenuous than I would have liked, and weaving in and out of the crowd was frustrating, but my daily training set in. My body was used to it. And when I hit that straightaway and saw the finish line ahead, I picked up the pace because I knew it was doable now. It's doable and I knew I was going to make it, and I never did stop like my goal was to walk, not even for a second. So I was happy when I crossed that line. And Later that day, I'm a competitor, so later that day I, I wanted to check out my age division. So I went and checked out my age division, and I didn't win. <laughs> I think I placed like 29th or 30, something like 29th or 36, I can't remember the numbers. And I, I looked at it and I thought, well, you know, I wanted to be in shape, and I was the best shape I'd probably been in in years. And instead of keeping it up, though, I quit after the race. Just quit with it. As for the winning time, I couldn't believe it. Somebody posted like 14, point, 14 minutes and one second. Can you imagine? I, when I looked at it, I go, that's got to be a misprint, because if I sprint the entire time, I can't do that. And they were younger guys. I could see them through like cracks in buildings as you were running. You just see somebody just flying that way. I could see these guys. They were younger, but it's still crazy to me. I started thinking about the fact that many of these folks race weekly, though. They've trained for years. They've invested in the process. They've leaned on other runners, nutritionists, sports psychologists, closely studied pace and wind and made sure the shoes they were wearing were perfect for that style and where they were running. They, they were in it, and it was in them. They were at another level. That race was just a simple tune-up for them for the half and full marathons. Actually, as we were leaving town, I was so glad. I was back in the back, back seat going, thank goodness I accomplished it. I, as we were driving out of town, there's still people just getting after it down the streets after the race. I'm going, man, those people are crazy. But they were rooted into the scene. Now, I did look down to notice that some took over an hour or so to complete the race. It was obvious that they weren't prepared to run or even jog this 5K. Maybe they originally wanted to, and they, they started out in that direction. They got full of excitement. They told everyone about their runs. They posted it on social media every day and even started with the health shakes and the protein shakes and all that stuff. But somewhere along the way, they burn out before race day. Or they let other things get in the way of practices needed to complete the task. Many of them had all the gear. All the shoes, the clothes, they had the headphones in. They really looked like professional runners. But they didn't use the resources given to benefit them and engage the race for what it was. And they were certainly within their rights to do so. Although I'm not sure what the point was. Hey, what's the point of you coming and being here then? You know, I, I've been in ministry for almost 20 years. As I said, when I look in the mirror, I'm starting to realize it's been at least 20 years. A lot has happened to my, my looks in the last few years. There's a lot going on there. But I observed a lot of folks over the years that go about the Christian journey in the same way. If you remember Jesus talking about seeds, and one part he's telling these parables about seeds, and he said there were seeds that fell on the pathway, some among thorns, and some fell in good soil, and some fell in rock, rocky soil. I understand each example he gave, but I've come across a lot of people that reflected that seed that was scattered among the rocks, and they sprang up, but they quickly withered. It's like a person set to run a race. They're, they're initially excited. They're ready to go. They'll do whatever it takes. There's a joy from that first encounter with the transforming grace of God. And as they go, there are these moments where they feel so good. 
Things are happening. They can see change. They're enjoying that change a little bit. Some epic things have occurred as well. And they notice they're changing and they're doing some things they never dreamed they would do. They're really starting to get it. They have a new family now in the faith community. And, and although life isn't perfect, they can see the difference others had talked about. And they can see progress. And they feel so good about the things. They're even bolder in what they commit to do. And they don't mind saying things to others about Jesus and the faith. It's, it's like they're on fire but not being consumed. You know what I'm talking about. They have something going, you can see it, and it's great. I've seen it many times. And I felt like, they, they, man, they've got the faith. It's, it's got them. They're, they're going to cross that finish line someday just like they're supposed to. They, we don't have to really worry about them, where, they're, where they are, because they're going to be fine. You can just see they're going to be fine. But those thoughts haven't always been correct. No, I've witnessed what is called the fade, I call it, or what some call the disappearance act. And since the pandemic, I've experienced it quite a bit. It's like some have digressed to hanging on by a thread, not going anywhere with Jesus or others in the faith community, and some have simply dropped off the course altogether. They, they aren't engaging any of the practices that help shape us as the people of God. Those runners that crossed the line at crazy times were deeply rooted in the process. And once I got through it and felt good, I just took a break and thought, as hard as that was, I went after it as best I could. I'm far back in the list. Well, no need me keep going on, so I never went back to it like I needed to. Some just dropped off before they even reached the finish line. If people have failed to dig roots through steady, consistent practices of faith, they will often disappear when the emotions of faith and the novelty of grace wear off. Now, I'm going to say that one more time. If people have failed to dig roots through steady, consistent practices of the faith, they will often disappear when the emotions of faith and the novelty of grace wear off. Happens all the time. Now, hear me out. God's grace we know is sufficient for whatever we're doing in our lives, whatever we're encountering. God continues to offer himself to us as we go. And as I said last week, this is God's work. This grace stuff is God's work. However, we have a part in this. We are to cooperate with God. We are to show up and say, here I am to engage the faith, to use the resources given by God to continue to walk in the faith and grow in the faith. You can't be a world-class runner or even a decent runner without practicing. And you can't be who God desires you be without practicing or nurturing the faith. It's impossible. So you might be asking, what sustains the grace at work in our lives? And what sustains that grace? Well, this can be tricky. And I'm going to get teachy today, okay? I'm going to get teachy more than preachy today. This can be tricky because to some, this will feel like I'm talking about works righteousness. Works righteousness. We need to understand there is a difference between working to try to earn grace and working the grace God has afforded us or resourced us with. You understand that? There's a totally different thing between working, I'm going to work and do everything to earn grace because we can't do that, but working the grace that God has already afforded us. Too often we've reduced the practice of the faith to like one thing. Whatever that one thing is to us, we kind of reduce the faith to that one thing. Let me give you some examples of it. For some people, it's an experience. You know, they just reduce the faith to an experience. Now, believe me, I totally get this one. It makes perfect sense to me. I remember, I'll never forget, one night I was in a, a, a retreat called Chrysalis. Anybody ever been on a Chrysalis or a Maya's Walk or something? Yeah. I was in a Chrysalis, and I was in this room worshiping, and it was a powerful service, and then people were kind of trickled out of the service, and it, things kind of toned down, and I was sitting in a row of chairs in this service, and I just was praying, and everything was quiet, and I felt like God lifted me up as if I were floating, or at the very least, I was on cloud nine, and I actually told someone there, I felt like I'm on the clouds, man. I feel like I'm on the clouds here. What a moment with God. And it was a time, I still remember this day, and it was great and wonderful, and it was a time I felt like God was making the call in my life to ministry more evident. And I don't care what others think about my, that moment for me. I don't care what people think of my experience. I just know what I experienced with God, and I loved it. And I wouldn't trade that night at all. And I've had different experiences over the years where there was no denying God was being extra good to me by his very presence with me in that moment. 
And usually after those times of worship or whatever it was I was doing when God showed up in this way that's undeniable, I, I would want to duplicate that. You know what I'm talking about? You know those services we have sometimes? You, you want to duplicate that experience. It was good, so good. I want to duplicate. I want it again, and I want it again. But we can't become addicted to experience. You can't become addicted to experience. We can't hop from one worship experience or one altar call to the next waiting to feel God. Because there will come a time when we face a situation where we don't feel God, and when that happens, it's tempting to wonder if it was real. So you can't just get caught up in the experiences that we have. For some, it's behaviors. They get caught up in behaviors. We received grace as a gift, but now we need to put into place all the rules and all the behaviors. Grace was freeing, a freeing gift, but our rules become our constraints on sinfulness, which often leads to legalism in the church. And man, I have seen legalism rip people apart. I've seen it hamper the journey for so many people. They get locked in on stuff like what type of clothes to wear. Now, don't get me wrong. Modesty, as Paul put it, it's a good thing and a mature act, and I wish more people took that seriously in our world. But it doesn't make the person more holy. It just doesn't. But people do that. If I just look this way, if I just dress this way and talk this way, if, I, if, I go, if I'll go there but I don't go there, if I refuse TV or radio that has unbecoming language, then that's good. If I don't support certain corporations by my giving or refusing to give because of their stance on certain issues that I don't get behind, can I just tell you, legalism can't sustain a meaningful journey of grace. Can't do it. Some people are trapped in that mess. How about this? For some, it's about knowledge. That, that's the one thing. If, that, that'll sustain our faith and, and grace by having the right knowledge, we think. We spend our lives learning, defending, and arguing propositional truths. It's about the right interpretation of the Bible, the right theological doctrines. Right, I mean, it's the, i, I got to tell you, it's funny to me. We have all these different kinds of churches in the world, and we all have different interpretations, and I love that because that's the beauty of the kingdom. People interpret things differently, and God works through it differently. But some people, oh, if you ain't with our doctrine, you, don't, you just can't be right. Right knowledge without a right heart will leave us wanting every time. For others, it's about being super spiritual. We believe that if we'll just get alone, read our Bible enough, pray enough, and volunteer for enough ministries, that, that'll do it. That surely will be enough for me. Uh, that'll take care of everything. And we attack our spirituality with the same vigor that soldiers attack their training. We become obsessive, obsessive about our quiet time. And we beat ourselves up for perceived failures of discipline. So, we'll become defeated. There's nothing, listen, there is nothing wrong with any of these things, okay? What I just told you. Experiences are good. I wouldn't trade the experiences I've had with God in some of those moments. I just want to stay in. Rules can be used to create helpful boundaries in our lives. And we need to know what we believe. You should know what it is you believe. And spiritual disciplines play an important role. But none of these things alone is sufficient for us. It won't get us where we need to go in one and of themselves. We need the sustaining grace of God at work in us to get us there. Now let me rehash so this makes sense for us. This is where I'm going to get teaching. Before Jesus, we are lost in sin. Okay, that's biblical. When we come to saving grace, we are saved by the hand of God, but we are by no means a finished product. We haven't arrived the day we say yes to the wonderful grace of God. Even in the scripture, the apostle Paul, who was very smart, certainly grasped the faith better than most of us will ever grasp it, mentioned his struggles early in this. He, he actually says, early on in the faith, he said, he said, I have struggled, and he said how sin was in control of his life like a taskmaster. He said in Romans 7, 19, For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. And as he continued in the journey of grace, though, you start to see the change. He experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the sanctifying grace or the transforming grace as we talked about last week. And he shares that when he is empowered then by the Holy Spirit, he is no longer a slave to sin and that he can overcome temptations because of God. He can say yes to God and no to sin. You can see that in Romans 7.25. This is what he says. 
Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. For the law of the spirit of life is Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. So apart from the Holy Spirit, our human will is weak and powerless to obey. With the Holy Spirit, we are empowered to obey. Now please listen, because folks get this confused out there when it comes to the Nazarenes. And that's what a lot of us are, Nazarenes. We're Christians who come to it through the Nazarene church. But this is what it says. They get confused a lot about this. The sanctified believer, they'll think this. It's not that the sanctified believer can never sin again. We, don't, we know better than that. Nobody believes that. But now we have the power to overcome the sin that wants to entrap us and destroy us. What's the difference, you ask? It is the sustaining grace of God at work enabling us to keep from falling or going back to our old life and our old ways. Now you need to grasp hold of that because I'm telling you it's true and it can happen and it has happened. I've experienced it. I don't go back, continue to go back to the old ways. That's what Paul did as he continued to nurture his faith. John Wesley was quick to add that the Holy Spirit strengthens our will that we might produce every good desire, whether related to our tempers, our words, or actions, to inward and outward holiness. Pretty good stuff. That's right, Jim. Preacher said amen. Sustaining grace is leading us to a deeper awareness of who God says we are and who he desires we be, and he desires we become more like Jesus every day. I love what N.T. Wright said. He said he believes that Christian character is formed in persons and churches through a long and yet steady growth in grace that comes as a result of spiritual practices and habits formed in a person's life that transforms them more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. The ancient writers used to call this character formation virtue, a virtue. How many of you remember seeing the movie Sully? Any of you see the movie Sully? None of you watch TV? Yes, one at one. Maybe you'll remember it when I, uh, maybe we shouldn't watch that much TV, I don't know. But it's based on the story of Captain Chesley Sullenberger. It was a Thursday afternoon, January 15th, I believe, 2009, and it felt like any other day in New York City. The commercial jet took off at 3.26 p.m. bound for Charlotte. Sully was the captain on this airplane. He did all the routine checks. Everything seemed normal until just two minutes after takeoff, the airplane slammed into a flock of Canadian geese. Both engines were severely damaged and lost power. The plane was heading north over the Bronx, one of the most densely populated areas of the city. Sully and his co-pilot had to make major decisions, and they had to make them fast. The lives of more than 150 passengers on board and thousands more on the ground were at stake. The, the closest smaller airports were too far away, they said, and landing on the New Jersey Turnpike would have been a disaster. They left uh, them only one other option. And now, if you remember the story, they landed on the Hudson River. And just three minutes before landing, Sully and his co-pilot had to do vital things to keep, to keep, uh, keep them going. I think it was like nine technical things that they had to do, and I won't mention those today. Remarkably, they did it. They landed the airplane on the Hudson River. Everyone got off safely with Captain Sully walking up and down the aisles, uh, taking times to check to make sure everyone had escaped before disembarking himself. Many people said it was a miracle. And at a certain level, it surely was. Yet where was the miracle? You know, for miracles come in many different forms. Was the miracle in God's supernaturally protecting and guiding hand? Certainly possible. However, there's another way to look at it too. Perhaps the miracle was Sully's virtue that made him able to respond with such technical speed under intense pressure. 
If using virtue in this way seems odd to you, it's because most of the time when we hear the word virtue, we're, we're thinking of it as good or moral. But N.T. Wright argues that virtue, in the strictest sense of the word, is what happens when someone has made a thousand small choices requiring effort and concentration to do something which is good and right, but which doesn't come naturally. And then, on the thousand and first time, when it really matters, they find that they do what's required automatically, as we say. In other words, when something looks like it just happens, we begin to realize it didn't just happen. I hate to tell you this, but if any of us were flying that plane that day, we would have crashed it into buildings because that would have been the natural thing to do. Nothing just happens. We don't just wake up one day and think, man, it's, uh, I'm just going to be better today because I believed in God. Virtue, character formation, or for our purposes here today, discipleship, that grows in grace to become more and more like Jesus is, is not what happens naturally. It's also what happens when wise and judicious choices become second nature to us. Sully did this stuff daily. He was disciplined. He was trained. He took advantage of the resource provided for his job. He invested himself, and it got into him. That's why he acted in the manner he did. Nothing just happens. And nothing just happens in the life of a Christian. We don't just automatically look like Jesus. We don't just wake up one day and bear the fruit Jesus says we're to bear. It happens as we journey in grace the same direction as we take inventory of our lives daily. Now, you've got to hear me on this because this stuff's not happening. Paul told uh, the, the Corinthian Christians in 2 Corinthians 13, 5 these words. Examine yourselves to see whether you are living in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you realize that, do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? I like Eugene Peterson's paraphrase really well. He says this Test yourselves to make sure you're solid in the faith. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. Give yourselves regular checkups. You need firsthand evidence, not mere hearsay, that Jesus Christ is in you. Test it out. If you fail the test, then do something about it. I love that. We as Christians must be more concerned with loving Jesus and living out the kingdom ways than we are with the ways of the world and giving into the desires that we might have that are contrary to the kingdom of God. Now, I know I'm quoting a lot of people today, but boy, they're just good. They're better than me. Wesley said, one of the joys of sustaining grace is that God gives us opportunities to grow and mature with his help and our cooperation. You see, Wesley believed we are formed into Christian character by God through habitual practices he called means of grace. Means of grace. He believed this would be hashed out in our personal time with God, but also as we grip the mission of God to the world. Wesley believed that it wasn't just all personal, it was also social. That we're in this together. And he saw this not as an activity, but many things. Not one just thing, but many things. It was a holistic approach. It's what he believed to the faith. Now here's just a few things he believed were means of grace. First, he said, is discipline. Discipline. The writer of Hebrews recognized the importance of spiritual discipline. In chapter 12, verse 11, this is what it says. Now, discipline always seems painful rather than pleasant at the time. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now, most of us see that word as punishment. You know, discipline is punishment for wrongdoing. My kids would certainly tell you that discipline is punishment for wrongdoing. But it's not. And discipline isn't always negative. But as Hebrews acknowledges, there's also such a thing as discipline to protect or make stronger. What if you saw it that way? To protect or make stronger. When we discipline our kids, we aren't punishing them. We are preparing them for the future. Trying to build them up so they can stand against all the world will bring their way that could harm them or destroy them. That's what we're doing in our home. 
If we're to give in to them whatever they wanted when they want it and didn't instruct them or give them boundaries, we would be setting them up for trouble. And I'm not willing to do that for my kids. I'm going to discipline them. E. Stanley Jones said, Jesus himself, who was God's son, was utterly dependent upon God and personally disciplined in his habits. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. Jesus, son of God, disciplined in his habits. How's that, pastor? Well, let me give you a few. One, if you remember reading through Scripture one time, there's a part where it said he stood up to read as was his custom when he went to the temple. His custom. What does that mean? It means he read the Word of God by habit every day. Number two, he went out to the mountains to pray as was his custom, it says. He prayed by habit. Number three, he taught them again, as was his custom. He passed on to others by habit what he had and what he had found. These simple habits were the foundation habits of his life. Holy habits form healthy disciples. Holy habits form healthy disciples. Other means of grace that Wesley believed were sacraments. Now, the Nazarene church hadn't done very good at some of these sacraments over the years. I hate to tell you that. To be honest with you, Wesley believed every time you meet, you need to break the bread. I agree. The Lord's Supper, communion, baptism, by participating in these practices, our lives are aligned more deeply to the mystery of heaven coming to earth in this mysterious way. Baptism reminds us that we are to die and be raised to new life, living that out daily in our lives. Live out your baptism. Communion reminds us of the sacrifice of God and the power of God to overcome the world and overcome sin. And when we participate, we recognize the presence of God with us to enable us to give and overcome in our lives. It's the beauty of these sacraments. God does something in the midst of it. Another means of grace was accountability. Today, when you hear people around the church use that word, it's not new to us. It goes all the way back to Wesley. He was steadfast in believing this was necessary for us to nurture our faith and continue in the journey of maturity. People were supposed to look at each other in the eye and ask each other tough questions. They were to spur each other on toward holiness and heart and life. Many of you know the name George Whitfield. He was considered, uh, more than Wesley, he was the best preacher of his hour. He was the most famous Protestant preacher of his time. He was one of the prime movers of the Great Awakening in the North America. And church. And he was friends with Wesley. And George Whitfield probably had reached thousands of more people through his preaching and through uh, revival type things and all the stuff he was doing. But this is what he said. As he came through this whole scenario, he looked at Wesley and said this about Wesley. He said, Wesley, by developing accountability in the life of every believer, had a work that has far surpassed and went beyond my work. What was he talking about? He said, I've done this, I've preached, I've told them about saving grace, I've done that, but I didn't take them any different. I didn't kind of go any further with my people. And he said, and they've been like they're in sinking sand. He said, I see Wesley in this accountability. He goes, it is right and it is good. Be in it, he said. Can I tell you something for every one of you sitting here? I advise you to enter into an accountability relationship with a mature Christian you trust in. Yeah, Don, that's right. We don't have enough time to get into everything Wesley believed was a means of grace. But let me just tell you some of the things that were very important to nurturing and growing the faith. Prayer, fasting, scripture reading, reflection, study, simplicity, solitude, submission, service, confession, worship, and relational accountability. It's beautiful stuff. Now, I want to turn back. I know I've been longer today in teaching, but I'm just about there. Let's turn back to Acts chapter 2 to look at the early church just to see how they went about it. This church was shaped and defined, we know, by the Pentecost moment, the, the uh, giving of the Holy Spirit, an experience of power coming from on high that radically transformed their lives in that upper room. Seemingly, these same people understood, even in that great moment, that great experience, they understood that they needed to organize themselves into environments for the ongoing nurture of the gift of grace. That's what they did in those environments. 
They had to put themselves in environments for that ongoing nurture of the gift of grace. And that's what we find in the passage. Here's what they said. For a holistic approach to life and community that nurtures grace and cultivates lives that receive the grace of God. Here's what they did. Number one, they're together, we find. They're together. The Christian life is never to be lived in isolation. And holiness can never be nurtured through individualism. You can't do it. Wesley said this is all social. The journey of grace always presupposes a community of people who to get, are together covenant to be raw, gritty, and real with one another. We don't need the fake stuff. Just be real. Community is a form of accountability. When you gather here on a Sunday, it's a form of accountability. We can never substitute a worship gathering for meaningful forms of being in community with one another. Just can't do it. Number two, they experience God together. As this community came together in sincerity and vulnerability, there were moments when God would move in transformative ways among them. They were filled with awe and many wonders, it says. God doesn't withhold an experience of awe from us, yet he does refuse to allow us to become addicted to experiences. He longs for intimacy with us, between us and him and between us and one another. He's not into parlor, tri parlor tricks and razzle-dazzle, as some would say. Number three, they meet regularly together. I'm going to highlight this. They meet regularly together. Nurturing grace isn't haphazard or willy-nilly. We are creatures of routine and rhythm. Too often people assume that a little dose, just a little dose of God every once in a while will be enough. It isn't. I'm telling you, it isn't. They devoted themselves to meeting regularly Seemingly understanding that we need to regularly be together for the sake of encouragement, challenge, accountability, and celebration. You can't forsake that, folks. I hate that so many miss this key reality. Number four, they are vulnerable together. They had everything in common. This meant they didn't hold back from one another. They lived their lives before one another and didn't mind their lives being examined by those who loved and cared deeply for them. You should want that in your life. Don't push people away because they're trying to help you. You should want those people who love you and care deeply to, to examine your life and help examine you. Now, is it risky? Most definitely. However, that risk in the rawest form is often the pathway toward a life freed from the barriers we construct and the pretending we are prone to. No need to pre pretend. Number five, they practice the faith together. Dr. Busick notes that there are means of grace that are formative in the lives of believers. Those means of grace, prayer, breaking bread, it said, they worship together and more, are vital activities for those who have committed to live out the Jesus journey. See, this isn't a game in here. This is real. Committed to leaving out the, living out the Jesus journey. Number six, they learn together. The scripture says that they devote themselves to the apostles' teachings. Well, what's that mean? It meant that they were reflecting on the Old Testament, the Torah, the stories of Jesus at that point, and the call of the Gospels and the content that would later become some of the letters of the New Testament. That's what they were devoting themselves to. In short, they studied together the story of God, a story that wasn't merely informative, but formative. They were being shaped by the teaching to live their lives in accordance with the teaching. You know why the Word of God's there for you? So you'll live according to it. It's not just self-help. So you'll live according to the ways of God. Number seven, they witness together. Did you realize that evangelism isn't an activity of the church? It's not an activity of the church. It is the natural expression of the church community that lives out the grace of God in the community day in and day out. You're an evangelist. Every one of you who claim to be a follower of Jesus. Day in and day out. Their lives reflect to others the restorative work of God. They embody what others long for. It's not one of these activities alone that sustains the grace among the early Christians. It's the disciplined interweaving of all of these practices experienced in and through community that sustains the grace among them. We need each other. There's no secret key to be extracted from the list just that there's no single compartment of our lives today that holds the key 
to our own ongoing holiness. The whole of who I am is caught up in the whole of who we are together. To live out the whole of the means of grace that nurture grace ongoing impact in our lives. So today as we close, we're going to celebrate. We're going to take communion together. Actually, I used the wrong word. This act is a reminder of the sustaining grace of God. By doing this today, we are simply declaring we believe, or that we rem- not that we believe or just remember, but that we are participating in the grace of God has claimed our lives. It's done collectively, reminding us that together as a community, we are dependent on the grace of God. It is an act of receiving, not taking. Receiving. We don't take the elements, but must receive them. Remembering that all of life is a gift from the hand of God. And after we finish at the table, we turn toward the world out there with the gift of grace still fresh on our lips. And that's what the world needs. Grace experienced through the body in the world. This morning, a song is going to play for a few moments, and then you're going to get the cup, and you want to, you can start peeling it back and be ready to, to receive communion today. He then held up the cup and said, This is my cup. It represents my blood shed and poured out for the sins of the world. Take and drink. It is never lost on me that Jesus extended that to everyone at the table. Even the one who would betray him, he extended it. This is the grace of God at work. It never ceases, it never stops. And we have a part to cooperate with, as I said today. Please nurture your faith. Nourish it. A weekly service like this is wonderful, but I think there's a lot of people in this church that would tell you, man, it's the, it's the actual rubbing elbows and locking arms with my brothers and sisters throughout the week that get me through in the faith, that help me grow, that help me become more like him. This is great. I love it. I want more in it. But it's just a piece of becoming that holistic version of who God wants us to be. So I invite you to go deeper, see where God will go and where God will lead you. Jesus, thank you for this day you've given us. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your victory and the power you give to us through the work of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to be who we were because of what you've done. To think of where we would be without you, I don't want to. I'm just glad I'm with you and that you're with me. And I thank you for being with our congregation, our church family. We're seeing you start to take people's lives. For some, they're new, they're babies in this. They don't get it all. We're starting to see the, their eyes, and it's like the light bulb's going off. <laughs> and they're starting to grasp some of it. The grace is being poured into them. For others, they've been on the journey for a long time, but they've really not matured much, and we're starting to see some take steps in this journey to be nurtured and nourish their relationship and become more mature as Paul talks about in the New Testament. But it's all by your work and your grace. We can't earn it. We can't do it on our own. We're just to show up and cooperate and give our lives into your hands. And when we do, everything changes. So we give you praise for who you are, for your love for us, and for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great Sabbath.